Hello everybody, it's black to play in this position and I'm testing your attacking instincts. I'm testing whether you can find this beautiful solution for black to have a winning advantage. Today we are talking about the Sam Shankham rule that says if a great looking move looks unplayable at first sight, you should try to make it work anyways. You should be stubborn and you should use your calculation ability to make that good looking move work. As they say, if there's will, there's a way, right? Or if you really, if it doesn't work, but if you really, really, really want to make it work, then it must work. That's a Soviet chess aphorism I heard somewhere. Okay, today we are seeing how this rule applies to attacking chess. I will show you some beautiful attacking positions where to be able to finish off the game, you should really, really defeat this tendency of, oh, this move looks unplayable, so I will just refuse to make it work. Yeah? So you will try to go a little bit deeper. You'll be stubborn and you'll use some, use some tactical resources to make your good looking idea work. In this case, folks, congratulations. If you first have spotted that there are some issues that you're facing, there are some tactical threats, but more importantly, the White King is completely locked in, has no square to escape, almost in a mating net, but this queen is doing a nice defensive function. For example, if you kick the queen with b6, then queen c3 is White's next move. So let's apply this rule to this position, folks. If you look a little bit deeper, the White King is almost in a mating net, right? We have beautiful attacking pieces, the bishop and the queen, but we need a final attacker, right? Namely, the rook, for example, would be great. You're also facing some issues here on the c7 square, and maybe white wants to go queen c3 and offer a queen trade, okay? So given this orientation phase, and given that this rook d6 move looks unplayable at first sight because of this, strong players, they defeat this tendency, they are stubborn, they will make that good-looking move work using some calculation. And congratulations if you decided to play this move anyways, because this creates a huge threat of rook c6, stops queen c3, and basically forces white's hands. And after this, obviously you take back with a c-pawn, and thus open the c8 square for your rook, and the game will be over directly. For example, queen c3, white has no other checks. Of course, you go rook c8, and after takes takes, we end up with extra material, but not only that, the king is also very much exposed. Black is a winning position. That's a beautiful illustration of the Sam Shankland rule in a way that, yes, yeah, strong players, they really, really try hard to make good-looking move work. And that's a good-looking move, right? You really want to involve your final piece into the attack. From a purely positional perspective, rook d6 is a great idea. But at first sight, it looks unplayable because of this, right? And here, what separates strong players? They still make that move using some calculation, using some tactics. And here, it works perfect for black. That's the shortest possible way to victory for black. Another position, folks, it's white to play. Please try to apply the lesson you just learned today, right? We are searching for a great finishing idea for white. White, yeah, white will finish the game as soon as possible here. That's the goal. It's a move that looks unplayable at first sight, but if you're a strong player, you should rely on your calculation skills to make that move work. Take a step back, stop the video, and please find not only the first move, but I want you to calculate a sequence that is only five ply deep, okay? It's a five ply deep calculation and ends up in a winning position for white. Folks, first of all, first things first, the black king is in a mating net if somehow your rook would appear on a chate if we mate. So from a positional perspective, from an attacking perspective, attacking instincts, rook h3 would be a great move, right? Because the next move is mate. Black has no defense. If only you could be able to play rook h3, then they must give up. Unless there is a winning tactic for black. And this you must calculate from this position. Does it work? Does it work, guys? Here's my second prompt to you. If you haven't seen rook h3 yet, please stop the video and calculate the consequences of rook h3. You're a great player if you found the entire sequence correctly, because yeah, rook h3 looks like unplayable at first sight because the rook can no longer cover the bishop, right? But here, king g1, of course, king g1 first, 
Can we play King H1 here? That would be a crazy bad blunder because we get mated on the next move, right? We don't want to play chess like this. <laughs> okay, so after Rook F2, check King G1. Well, there's only a single check left in the position. And what's the move? You're a great player if you found King H1 because you're stopping all possible checks right now. And Rook H8 is game over, basically. So Black has to give up one full Rook, in fact, in this position to save himself. But of course, yeah, we are having a completely winning position in this case. So you see, that's the same Shankin rule again in its purest form because this is a move that you really would love to make, right? From an attacking perspective. It looks unplayable at first sight because the rook is tied down on the bishop. And here comes the calculation ability. Yeah? This is what separates strong players. They really, really want to make those good-looking moves work using tactics. There's a structure in their thinking. They don't randomly look for checks, captures, threats. They try to identify the great-looking moves in any position. And this gives them right, like a, like a structure in their calculation. They don't calculate random moves. They calculate those moves that potentially can give them great benefit. And that's a beautiful calculation sequence that ends up the game, finishes the game as soon as possible. That's also the great thing with calculation, because if you're good at calculation, you're really, right, making things easier for yourself. The game is immediately over after three moves, as in this case, right? The game is over. You don't need to suffer like 25 moves in some deep end game. Talking about attacking chess, I have to show you a Gary Kasparov example, because it was a great attacking player and this example also shows us the depth of Gary Kasparov's calculations in this case you have two choices is it c takes d4 or rook takes d4 Gary sees some attacking potential on the king's side right the white king is lonely and he wants to involve somehow yeah the attacker on d8 that's his vision he will love that rook to join the attack join the party on the king's side but it looks unplayable at first sight right at first sight, it looks like if I take on d4, then there's a fork, knight f3, right? And here comes Gary's depth of calculation because he takes on d4 anyways. And after knight f3, can you tell me Gary's next move? Yes, rook g4, pinning that knight because knight takes e5 leads to mate on the board, right? So here, maybe some of you have seen this. And also this move creates a big threat of queen takes f3, of course. But what if after h3, right? It looks like white can go h3 and the rook cannot stay on the g-file. And otherwise, I will take your rook on e5. It looks like things are collapsing for black. And then comes Gary's depth of calculation and vision. You're a great player if you found the, the whole sequence. Rook takes g2 check. King takes g2. What's the next move? Of course, rook g5 using this pin. And after king h2. Can you tell me the next move, folks? The final piece joins the attack. Even the bishop is involved. And after knight takes e5, we finish off the game with queen g2 mate. Incredibly beautiful attacking chess from Gary Kasparov, who made this possible already here, right? From this position, he must have seen the entire sequence, folks, right? Here, again, we see master's depth of calculation, but he's looking at the right direction, right? He really wants to involve his rook. If he takes with the c pawn here, then queen d3. The pawn is blockaded. Black is slightly better, but this pawn is also getting in the way of our bishop. The rook is passive. You see, our attacking potential is reduced in this position. But com compare and contrast this with rook takes d4. He doesn't just shy away because of knight f3. He goes deeper, and then he finds this entirely entire sequence which is based on the sacrifice. And of course, if the king goes to h1, right, we see the point of this. The queen joins the attack and mate will follow on the next move. So everything is forced, in fact, why it is no defense. And the final attacker joins the battle and the game is over. Beauty. I will leave you guys with this homework position. One of my own students was playing with the black pieces and actually found this beautiful solution. Here, of course, black is attacking on the king's side. But for the moment, right... The queen seems to be pinning this knight on f4, right? That was the whole point of this because the f7 square would be attacked twice, okay? So I want you to look at this position. Black has two miners for the rook in terms of material, but most importantly, we are attacking, of course. So I want you to calculate a sequence, a sequence, and write to me on YouTube what that sequence is. Does it work? 
and how do you reach your dream right because your dream is to checkmate the white king in this position please use your calculation skills please don't shy away from moves that look unplayable and find nice solution here folks if you like this video please give me a like and subscribe that's very important for me to continue making such instructive videos for you folks if you want to explore more of these subjects please check my chessable course fundamental chess calculation skills there i go through the step-by-step -step calculation process to help you get better this maybe the most important phase of chess right calculation the most important skill you must improve otherwise i will catch you on similar themes on strategy and tactics and how they are always intertwined because that's what we learned once and again in this video right they are not separate strategy is helping our tactics and vice versa we are using tactics to justify our strategic goal in chess in this video we show how to attack how to reach our strategic goal of attacking the enemy king and tactics and calculation are used to achieve our goal thank you so much